Chapter 9 And so it was that he no longer saw this thing pictorially, nor in the little detached reports the individual senses brought, but knew it in himself, complete, as a man knows love and passion. Memory afterwards translated these vast central feelings into pictures, but the pictures touched reality without containing it. Like a vision, it happened all at once, as a room or landscape happens, and what happens all at once, coming through a synthesis of the senses, is not properly describable later. To instantaneous knowledge, mere sequence is a falsehood. The sequence first comes in with the telling afterwards. That kneeling form, he understood, was the empty vessel to which conventional life had hitherto denied the heat and air it craved. The breath of life now poured at full tide into it. The fire of deity lit its heart of touchwood. Wind blew into desire. And later, flame would burst forth in action, consuming opposition. He must let it fill to the brim. It was not salvation, but creation. Then thought went out extinguished by a puff of something greater. For beyond the smoke and sparks, beyond the space the men had occupied, a new and gentler movement, lyrical with bird-like beauty, ran suddenly along the ridge. What Hendricks had taken for branches heaped in rows for the burning, stirred marvelously throughout their whole collective mass, stirred sweetly, too, and with an exquisite loveliness. The entire line rose gracefully into the air with a whir as of sweeping birds. There was a soft and undulating motion, as though a draft of flowing wind turned faintly visible, yet with an increasing brilliance, like shining lilies of flame that now flocked forward in a troop, bending deliciously all one way. And in the same second, these tall lilies of fire revealed themselves as figures, naked above the waist, hair streaming on the wind, eyes alight and bare arms waving. Above the men's deep pedal bass, their voices rose with clear, shrill sweetness on the storm. The band swept forwards, swift as wind towards the kneeling boy. The long line curved about him foldingly. The women took him as the south wind takes a bird. There may have been, indeed there was, an interval, for Hendricks caught, again and again repeated, the boy's great cry of passionate delight above the tumult. Ringing and virile, it rose to heaven, clear as a fine-wrought bell, and instantaneously the knitted figures of flame disentangled themselves again, the mass unfolded like an opening flower and, as by a military word of command, dissolved itself once more into a long, thin line of running fire. The women advanced, and the waiting men flowed forward in a stream to meet them. This interweaving of the figures was as easily accomplished as the mingling of light and heavy threads upon some living loom. Hands joining hands, all singing, these naked worshippers of fire and wind passed in and out among the blazing piles with a headlong precision that was torrential and yet orderly. The speed increased, the faces flashed and vanished, then flashed and passed again, each woman between two men, each man between two women, and Lord Ernie, radiantly alive, between two girls of rich, overflowing beauty. Their movements were undulating, like the undulations of fire, yet with sudden, unexpected upward leaps, as when fire is partnered abruptly by a cantering wind. For the women were fire, and the men were wind. The imitative dance was in full swing. The marvelous wind and fire ritual unrolled its old world magic. It was awe-inspiring, certainly, but for Hendricks, as he watched, the terror of big conflagrations was wholly absent. Rather, he felt the sense of deep security that rhythmic movement causes. Bathed in a sea of elemental power, he burned to share the pagan splendor and the rush of primitive delight. It seemed he had a cosmic body in which new centers stirred to life, 
linking him on to this source of natural forces. Through these centers, he drew the chaotic energy into nerves and blood and muscle, into the very substance of his thought, indeed transmuting them into the magic of the will. Abundant and inexhaustible vigor filled the air, pouring freely into whatever empty receptacle lay at hand. Sheets of flame, whole separate fragments of it, torn at the edges, raced loudly, hungrily flapping on the vehement gusts of wind. Curved as they flew, leaped, twisted, flashed, and vanished. And the figures closely copied them. The women tossed their bodies aloft, then dipped suddenly to the earth, invisible, till the rushing men urged them into view again with wild, impetuous swing, so that the entire line stretched and contracted like an immense elastic band of life, now knotted, now dissolved. Yet, while of raging and terrific beauty, there was never that mad abandon which is disorder, but rather a kind of sacred natural revel that prohibited mere license. There was even a singular austerity in it that betrayed a definite ritual and not mere reckless pageantry. No walls could possibly have contained it. In cathedral, temple, or measured space, however grand, it could only have seemed exaggerated and apostate. Here, Beneath the open sky, it was beautiful and true. For overhead, the stars burned clear and steady, the constellations watching it from their immovable towers, a representation of their own leisured and hierarchic dance in swifter miniature. And indeed, this relationship it bore to a universal rhythm was the key, it seemed, to its deep significance. For the close imitation of natural movements seduced the colossal powers of fire and wind to swell human emotions till they became mold and vessel for this elemental manifestation in men and women. Golden yellow in the blaze, the limbs of the women flashed and passed, their hair flew dark a moment across gleaming breasts, and their waving arms tossed in ever-shifting patterns through the driving smoke. The fires boiled and roared, scattering torrents of showering sparks like stars, and amid it all, the slim white shoulders of the boy, his clothes torn from him, his eyes ablaze, and his lips opened to the singing as though he had known it always, drove to and fro on the crest of the ritual like some flying figure of wind and fire incarnate all of which, instantaneously yet in sequence, Hendricks witnessed, painted upon the wild night sky. A volcanic energy poured through him too. He knew a golden enthusiasm of immeasurable strength, of unconquerable hope, of irresistible delight. Wind set his feet to dancing, and fire swept across his face without a trace of burning. Nature was part of him. He had stepped inside, no obstacle existed that could withstand for a single second the torrential energy that fired his heart and blood. There was lightning in his veins. He could sweep aside life's difficult barriers with the ease of a tornado and shake the rubbish of doubt and care from the years with earthquake shocks. Empires he could mold and play with nations, drive men and women before him like a flock of sheep. Shatter convention and dislocate the machinery time is foisted upon natural energies. He knew in himself the omnipotence of the lesser elemental deities. Yet, as sympathetic observer, he can but have felt a tithe of what Lord Ernie felt. We are the whirlwind and we are the fire, he cried aloud with the rushing worshippers. We are unconquerable and immense. We destroy the lukewarm and absorb the weak. For we can make evil into good by bending it all one way. The roar swept thunderingly past him, catching at his voice and body. He felt himself snatched forward by the wind. The fire licked sweetly at him. It was the final abandonment. He plunged recklessly towards the surge of dancers. <laughs>